So today we're really spoiled for choice with uh, our readings and gospel. Um, yesterday we had the beginning of the book of Genesis and we'll be hearing from the book of Genesis now for the next two weeks. So all of this week and next week up until Friday, we'll be hearing uh, different passages from Genesis. And then the gospel today speaks about tradition. And I really have to choose one or the other or it'll just go on too long. It would be really, really good to talk about tradition and how tradition works with sacred scripture, how they're not uh, mutually exclusive, but how indeed scripture is born through tradition. So the, the, this oral tradition is passed on, scripture is lived, and then in, in tradition, right, as in the way people live, that's, that's how scripture is passed on, and eventually it's written down. So actually, tradition comes before scripture. Scripture is, is, is a fruit of tradition. And that isn't to say, of course, that anything that becomes a local habit amongst people is tradition. There's tradition with the big T, tradition with a small T for those who do theology, right? Tradition with a big T, this is a, a divine source of revelation, right? So it's immutable and it's, it's not whatever is done locally in, in any particular parish, that's not tradition with a big T, that's local tradition, which can change and can be wrong. A tradition with a big T cannot, but you really can't get into that. Sorry, so just, yeah. <clears throat> It would be good, it would, it would be good, but we haven't time. Okay, so yesterday we had the account of creation, okay? Um, this is, a, it's a very common question amongst people, how to reconcile uh, the Bible and science, or how to reconcile what's divinely revealed here through this, this, this account of creation and maybe what we know through scientific discovery. And then even theologically, just on its own, this account of creation, why is it divided this way? What, what, can, we, what can we learn from it? Is, what's useful to us today in the 21st century? So there's, there's an awful lot here, um, which we'll try and summarize very, very briefly. So, uh, okay, a couple of things, and then we'll get into being created in God's image and likeness, which is kind of the high point of creation. Okay, so, God creates in stages. Right? So it's okay for us to believe that God can create in stages. Not everything has to be created fully complete in one go. God can create through a process. If he so wishes, of course he can. So we shouldn't think that scientific discovery is a threat to theology. Scientific discovery can actually confirm theology. So the more we discover about cells and DNA and, and all this kind of thing, this is absolutely amazing. Now we're discovering this genius of God. Now, obviously, Genesis doesn't talk about cells and DNA, uh, but it's not a science book. Genesis is not a science book. It's not, it's not a scientific account of creation, okay? Uh, its purpose is not to be a scientific account. Its purpose is to show everything is created by God. Everything comes from God. Everything is created with a purpose, and everything has an end. Everything, has the, everything that's created has a goal, right? Everything comes from God in order to return to God. That was the plan. What happened? Sin entered the world. Because of God? No. Because of an abuse of human freedom. And then God sets about this plan to redeem the world. This is what Genesis is, is, is communicating to us. Okay, So it's not a science book. That said, science isn't a threat to what we read here. Some things have to be kind of correctly understood though. It says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was a formless void and there was darkness over the deep. And God's spirit hovered over the water and he said, let there be light. And there was light. God thought the light was good and created the light from darkness called the light day and the darkness night. Evening came and morning came the first day. Okay, first day. Sounds fairly straightforward. But the sun and the moon, which govern night and day, are created on day four. So what's evening and morning? Well, how does all this work like? So uh, St. Augustine says that the these the light, when we even talk about light here, what, does, what, what, what are we talking about? Because we're not talking about the sun, because that's not created until day four. Uh, St. Augustine says that these are the angels, creatures of light, okay? So the first thing that's created are the angels. Now, the angels don't need the earth as we have to stand on and eat and, and sleep on and things. Angels don't need that. So they're created first. These are the creatures of light. And when God's plan is revealed to them, when, like in, in, they, they, because angels are closer to God, 
they have a higher intelligence. They know God's plan. They know God's mind. They know him so much better than we do because they see him. Okay? So in God then, God who's outside of time, it's revealed to them that God is going to create the world. God is going to create a creature known as man or mankind who will fall. God will become man, an inferior creature to an angel, an inferior nature to angelic nature. God will, be, will take on that nature, become inferior to an angel. And a third of the angels say, we will not serve. Creating darkness. The angels fall from heaven. Okay? So we have, and, and the reason St. Augustine says, the reason they're not called angels or demons at this point, he said when this would have been uh, transmitted now uh, at the time of, of Moses, the people were very, very prone to idolatry. So if they had heard about these angelic creatures who don't have, you know, creatures who don't have bodies, so they're, they're there, but you can't see them. They're these heavenly presences. Uh, St. Augustine argues that they would have fallen immediately into idolatry. They would have started adoring the angels. So for the moment, they're revealed. It's written, but they're masked, if you will, veiled behind the terms light or heavens and darkness or night. So God creates the angels then God creates the world. Little by little. Uh, okay, uh, I won't go into everything here. Yeah, so creates the sun and the moon and all that on day four. Now, today we heard of the creation of man. And there's, there's, there's an awful lot here. St. John Paul II now could, could keep you for weeks talking about these few verses, or probably this, this one verse. God said, Let us make man in our own image, in the likeness of ourselves. And let them be masters of the fish of the sea, the birds of heaven, the cattle, all the wild beasts and reptiles that crawl upon the earth. Okay, a couple of details. God said, what? Let us make man in our own image. Let us, plural. Who's us? Who's we? God is a trinity. So God, in and of himself, in his very divine nature, is communion, right? Why? Because God is love. And so in order to be love, you have to have someone to love. Otherwise, it's just static. If you're the only thing that exists and there's nothing else, what do you love? If, if nothing else exists but you and your one solitary being, how can you say you're love? Because there is nothing to love, right? But God is in and of himself, a communion of love. He's all, he's a, he is a trinity. So there's always someone to love because there's, there's another person of the divine trinity. So, so the, the, there's an eternal, eternal exchange of love, which then God says, let us make man in our own image. Now, God created man in his own image and likeness. Uh, again, there's an awful lot we can say about this, but we'll just draw two points out of it. In God's image and likeness, what is it that we have in common with God? What can we do that God can do that animals can't do? So what is it that sets us apart from the, the animal kingdom? What is it that makes us different? What is it that makes us like God? <clears throat> there are a few things. One, most importantly, is the ability to love. Okay, the ability to love. Animals are wonderful. They really are. I have, I'm a big fan, especially of dogs, not of cats, and not really of goldfish, but uh, dogs, absolutely. And... Dogs, can, they're great, but they can't love like a human can. Animals act on instinct. So food, eat. Female, and, <laughs> you know, fox poo, roll in it. You know, it's just, it's instinct. Doom, doom, doom. You know, it's like, you, you, this thing would be good to eat or chew on, so I'll do it. And, and it's, just, it's all instinct. It's just instinct, instinct, you know? Like, when I put the food down... They'll eat it quickly because back in the day when they were wolves, if they were descended from wolves, which some dogs aren't, um, uh, they had to eat quickly or you wouldn't get anything, right? So they, they horse food in. Like, you know, it's all instinct. It's just, they just work on instinct. Everything is instinct. They hear a bang, they run. But it's a firework. It's a safe bang. It's a different kind of a bang to a shotgun. You know, like, but they can't tell the difference. It's a bang, go. It's all just, just instinct. Whereas we can, we human beings, we can work and live on a plane above instinct, or at least we should. And this is kind of what sin does. Sin, sin pulls us down into just 
well, instinct. You know, you see something, I see a beer, I have to drink it. Uh, I see something that's enticing on the internet, I have to watch it. Uh, I see someone who I'm attracted to, even though I'm married, well, I suppose I have to pursue that too. You know, so sin actually drags us down to a kind of a lower base, almost animal-like nature, where we just react on instinct. Just, we work on instinct. We're called to actually to a higher nature than that, to be created like in God's image and likeness, okay? So we're not motivated by instinct anymore, like, like the animals, but we're motivated by love. So that, this kind of drags us away from mere instinct to a higher order. So because I love my wife, I see this other attractive lady, so what? You know, because I'm, I love my children, even though I'm tired and I'd prefer to be watching a match, I'll play football with them, go hurling with them, watch them do their little dance recital thing, you know, I, I'll, because I love them. So we've a high, higher nature, you know, we choose, choose the greater good, not just fulfill instinct. So we're creating God's image and likeness, so we can, we can love. Even like the basic things, I can be hungry, I can choose to fast out of love. The most like, uh, self-preservation, you know, eat, sleep, shelter, I, I can actually choose to renounce some of those things out of love for God because I'm called to a, a higher, higher nature than simply just fulfilling instinct. Okay, philosophically we can also argue that man is capable of what's called abstract thought, okay? Which means like the idea of Wednesday. But we know what that is, it's the third day of the week. Explain Wednesday to an animal. You know, it's how we divide time. Uh, you can have an abstract thought like justice explain justice to, to an animal. You see, we, we, we can have thoughts that can govern our actions, but they're not material things. We're, we're out of the material order of things and we're into a, a spiritual or a notional or an intellectual level. We can do that as human beings. God can do that. God who like, speaks to us through Im images, signs, symbols. You see green, white, and gold all side by side and it makes you stand a little taller, you know? You see someone burn that green, white, and gold side by side, and you feel angry, right? Because why? This, it's a symbol. It represents our country. Therefore, it represents our nation. It represents you. But it's a symbol. They are three colors, <laughs> you know? Uh, so we're, we're capable of, of, of abstract thought, but let's not get too silent about that. We're creating God's image and likeness. So fundamentally, and maybe most simply, what does that mean? Well, if I'm creating God's image and likeness, have you ever noticed how children are similar to their parents? You know, same curly head in them, same freckles, same flat nose, spiky nose, hobbit ears, whatever it may be. Like, just, uh, you know, oh, you've got your father's eyes, God help you, you know, <laughs> you know web feet, or whatever, whatever it is like. Um, but creating God's image and likeness, you know, children are like their parents. We're creating God's image and likeness. We're supposed to be like God. And fundamentally, because we're creating God's image and likeness, we're children of God. That's our identity. That's who we are. It's our dignity. We're created to be like God. We're created like God. And in that being created like him, let us create man, then we're also created with a desire for community, union, love. Why? Because that's the way God is. God is a communion of love. So when we're created, we're created with a desire for love, a desire for intimacy, a desire to be known and to be loved, a desire to be held, a desire to be understood. Why? Because God is love, and in, in God there is perfect love, perfect self-giving. So we desire that too. Now sin will come in and try and distort that image into my desire for love It is a desire to satisfy lust. My desire for unity is a desire for just simply a, a carnal expression of, of that. Uh, but again, we're called to, to love, to, to purify all those uh, intentions and desires and turn them into self-gift. Gift of oneself for love of the other. So we're creating God's image and likeness. God who is a communion, we're created with a desire for communion, unity, love, whatever you want to call it, family. Right from the beginning, this is imprinted in our hearts. And then immediately afterwards, 
male and female, he created them. That's where the theology of the body can, can kick off then, how man is incomplete without woman and vice versa, and their complementarity is what makes union. They're, so therefore, their differences together is what creates union. So we haven't tr time to go into that this morning, but we've been created in the image and likeness of God. So today we can take from that. It means that we've been created for love. We've been created for unity. We've been created for self-gift. And so we ask the good Lord to purify our world from all that calls simply to satisfy the basest needs of our being. And may we satisfy rather the, our highest calling to be a gift of love to each other. Amen.